Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to come and meet with you this evening to speak about some of our recommendations that we have for Ericsson. My name is Paul von Martels. I'm part of uh, Team Budapest, and I'm joined here with some of my colleagues, James Larson, Daniel Morrow, and Hussein Gavani. So before we get too far into the presentation, I'd like to take a few minutes to redress why we're here tonight. And that there's really two reasons why we're here tonight, and they all sort of revolve around uh, Ericsson's success and their sort of, you know, being the center of, you know, the network connection globally. And being in that sort of epicenter, looking for an opportunity to improve the quality of life for people across the world. <clears throat> and second to that is finding a way to identify new business opportunities and, of course, you know, secure your financial future uh, into the future as well. And over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to identify a number of business opportunities and a number of ideas, and they all sort of fold into you know, what we're calling our roadmap uh, to 2015 and really beyond. Whoops. So we've identified three recommendations. And these recommendations really, you know, roll up to an overarching theme. And this overarching theme is about Ericsson becoming the architect of the networked uh, society in the future. And so how do we do that? How are we recommending that Ericsson do that? There's three reasons. There's three ideas. And the first is about integration. Integration both up into the cloud and down into the device area. I mean, moving upwards into the cloud, I mean, we've just seen that there's been some recent, a recent partnership uh, built with, uh, with Akamai. It's things like that. Moving down, of, again, there's technology that's being, that's being built out for some of the devices that really support that, that seamless end-to-end -end relationship all through the value chain. The second, the second recommendation is about sort of keeping that focus, keeping that focus on the core business. And we're going to come up with a lot of ideas tonight. And, you know, we are not recommending any sort of transgression away from the core business. There's been a lot of success there. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of momentum in this market. And we are certainly recommending that Ericsson stay focused on that. And the third opportunity, or third, pardon me, the third recommendation is about, you know, keeping focused on that emerging market, or the emerging markets. It's not just about selling more network equipment or anything like that, but, you know, it's part of that. But it's also staying on the cutting edge, it's being there to support, and it's also a focus on integration, much like we're seeing here in the developed markets. Before I move off this slide, too, uh, I'll note, just to sort of pique your interest, that the opportunities that we're going to present tonight aligning to these recommendations are estimated to generate up to $300 million in EBITDA by 2015, uh, additionally generating about 60, a 65% IRR and adding about $1.3 billion in enterprise value. And, you know, we're talking about industries as we start to move down into these opportunities, and you know, before we get too far into the industries, we just want a chance to say there's lots of opportunity for Ericsson. To focus on one or two industries, one or two geographies would be too myopic. Um, you know, there's opportunities in transportation, there's opportunities in agriculture, there's opportunities in education, but because we're trying to stay focused on what we can, what we can tangibly make differences in, and because we're focused on you know, creating, a, creating a, an improvement in quality of life and those, those business opportunities, we're focused on the, tonight we're focused on the U.S. healthcare and energy distribution market. Both big markets, lots of opportunity, there's growth in them, there's a huge impetus for change, and that's where we're targeting. So to hear more about these, uh, some of these markets, I'm going to pass it over to James. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul mentioned, there's enormous opportunity in a myriad of industries. But uh, what we'd like to do is illustrate uh, the potential of uh, both the broadband, the mobility, and the cloud through a couple industries, as Paul mentioned. And the first is going to be the healthcare industry. 
So behind me here, I have a, a diagram of, of basically the scope of the industry. As you'll see, there's sort of the information, that's uh, the claims data, prescriptions, uh, insurance information. Of course, you have the doctors, uh, the, the physicians, the nurses. Uh, there's the care facilities themselves, so the actual hospitals, and of course the patients. And, and you've noticed, uh, you'll notice that we've mentioned both insured and uninsured patients. That will come up a little bit later. But what we really want you to focus on here is that um, this, there's really going to be a, an evolution in this industry a, a, through, through the mobility. And so, for example, you take care facilities. So with the proliferation of RFID, for example, um, it's going to rapidly change how inventory management uh, it takes place at hospitals. And of course, uh, data processing as well. Uh, in terms of the cloud network, information is, is now going to be housed externally and accessed from anywhere. So you can see that there's a lot of opportunities available with uh, the evolving structure. So our team is, is now just going to outline what we, what we recommend going forward. So for the healthcare industry, our team recommends uh, a strategic opportunity that is, acts as a liaison between doctors and patients. And in the middle there we have American Well. Um, and so American Well is actually a company that we recommend Ericsson partner with. So American Well is a, a young fledgling company and what they do is they provide an online service uh, that connects patients and doctors. So, so for example, I, I get out of bed in the morning and, and I'm not feeling well and I don't feel like uh, driving to the physician's office because um, quite frankly in the states there it ranges between 1 and 20 days, up to 20 days waiting time at physician's offices. So I go online, I go onto my mobile device and I touch my app and I'm instantly connected real time with a physician. And over at the physician, he's on his mobile device connecting with me trying to earn some part-time revenue to supplement his income. So American Will has that capability and Ericsson by partnering with them can really, as Paul mentioned earlier, really develop that end-to-end -end capability. Now the beauty of this system is with the cloud computing there's the capability for uh, instant access to the claims uh, information, uh, medical history for the doctors, and so really what we're seeing is uh, an extraordinary improvement in convenience, uh, efficiency, and of course a lower cost. So <clears throat> I've talked a little bit about how, how this actually would play out. We've talked about the, the seamless integration. O on this slide, I'd really like to direct your attention to uh, the, the lower left-hand corner with the potential partners. Because as we said, there, there's really a lot of opportunity here. And for example, like Johnson & Johnson, companies like that, there's, there's a lot of opportunity further than just American Well to really bundle up um, uh, the mobility and Ericsson's platforms to really um, create that end-to-end -end solution. Now, of course, we got to look at the competition. So what does the competition look like in this space? Well, there's six main competitors. And uh, there's a couple key issues here. One is that uh, because there's about seven players, including American Will, it's highly fragmented. So there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, but what's really important here is that American Will's business model is completely different than these other six. So American Well actually uh, goes straight to the consumer, uh, to the patient rather, instead of uh, these six, which in fact actually work solely with uh, health insurers. So the opportunity there is, for example, as I mentioned earlier with the patients and the, uh, the insured patients and the non-insured patients, is that actually uh, pretty much doubles the market. There's about 100 million uh, total patient visits per year um, by, by focusing on both the insured and uninsured. Um, so, so that's really why we think American Well is, is uh, perfectly positioned for us. So that, that wraps up the, the healthcare market. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague Dan who's going to explore a little bit of the opportunities that we have uh, recommended in the energy market. Thanks James. So James took us through what we thought is a great opportunity in the healthcare market and I'd like to do the same now with what we think is a great opportunity in the energy market. So just to go through a brief overview of where we see the energy market heading and where there's opportunity, I'd like you to focus on these two charts. So the first chart I'd like to talk about is the average retail cost of energy. I think we all know energy costs are going up, and that's what this chart shows. Going up across residential, commercial, and industrial. There, there are increasing costs, and that's the trend. Now, what impact is this causing? Well, it's creating a, a pretty large focus on uh, consumption, energy consumption management, 
and, and this is critical. People want to reduce their costs by reducing their energy consumption and managing their uh, energy use better. You can see, for example, through smart meter penetration that smart meters and the adoption of smart meters is increasing year over year at a significant rate. By 2009, penetration on average was at about 40%. Uh, we see this increasing significantly all the way through 2015, and this obviously presents a great opportunity and signal that the energy uh, management market is, is critical and, and there's opportunity there. So where will Ericsson play in this market? Well, we suggest that Ericsson acquire a small startup company called Cavett Technologies. The acquisition cost will about, be about $60 million, but we know, that even though this is not chump change, Ericsson is projected to have $17 billion of cash on their balance sheet by 2012. Now, we also know that Ericsson, in their 2010 annual statements, has said that they'd like to focus on growth through the acquisition of small and medium-sized businesses, and we think that Cavett Technologies fits the bill. So now, what is Cavett Technologies? Cavett Technologies is something unique and different. When they developed this, they had to actually create a new standard because nothing existed like this in the market. It's patented and they have a worldwide freedom to operate, which means there's nothing like this in the world currently. So how it works is you have your electric wiring, your black wire and your red wire. That connects to that little shoebox CPU. Anyone can do it, and by anyone I mean any electrician. So it takes about 15 minutes to install, and it controls currently in its application with lighting 130 fluorescent lights, which is fairly significant for one box. Now what it does is it uses an algorithm to slice the sign signal. What that basically means is it sends pulses through the electric, uh, electricity before it reaches the light. But this reduces energy consumption without dimming the actual lights because the pulse is so rapid that to the naked eye you can't tell. But what happens is energy consumption is instantly reduced by 30% and that is significant. And that is, you know, that just speaks to uh, such an impact on the reduction of consumption. Now these CPUs are also wired for IP configuration which means they can transmit two-way information between uh, any wireless portals. And this is where we see the strategic fit with Ericsson. So what we suggest is that Ericsson acquire Cavett Technologies and build the backbone for the energy management system. This energy management system, uh, as I'm sure we, we're all aware, will we'll use uh, signals from multiple appliances throughout the house, signals from LumaSmart, uh, that really signify the energy consumption, allow it to be managed. Now what this Ericsson then does is this, this information, it's not just data, it's information, is stored in a database, it's analyzed, and then services can be built off this. And this is critical, because you're not just selling hardware, you're selling an annuity, you're selling a service. A and we feel that there's great value here. The cloud also allows a remote access portal, so you can control your appliances, your lighting, uh, manage your energy consumption from any wireless portal, whether it's your handheld, your tablet, or your work PC or home PC. Now all this spells a big opportunity. That initial $60 million investment we project will result in an incremental $1.3 billion addition to Ericsson's enterprise value, and we see a 65% IRR, which is substantial. Now, we'd be naive to think that there's no competitors in this space. There, there are competitors. However, the market's highly fragmented, and it, it's still fairly new. They're, they're still developing. There's actually a lack of customer focus is what we've found. Uh, Companies are targeting consumers across the board. And you can see this in the pricing flexibility. A lot of companies are offering the same service. Some are doing it for free. Others are charging a percentage of uh, utility savings. And all of them offer no intellectual property that will help you instantly reduce your consumption. And so we see that it's in this area that Ericsson has an opportunity. Ericsson can offer intellectual property that will automatically reduce your consumption by 30%, as well as the energy management capabilities that will help you continue, continue to manage and lower your consumption. And, and this is critical. So we see 
Ericsson rolling out first in an industrial and commercial space with lighting where LumaSmart currently is, and then building off that technology to other applications like uh, electrical vehicles, hybrid vehicles, uh, any appliance that plugs into a wall socket, and, and there's critical opportunity here. I'm now going to pass uh, it back to Paul, who will take you through the third pillar of our recommendation and why we feel it's important. Thanks. <clears throat> so our last recommendation was really about focusing on, <clears throat> excuse me, the core business of Ericsson. And we looked at that and we said, how are we going to really, how are we going to best do that? So in some research, we basically decided that we would assess Ericsson on their four strategic priorities. I'm not going to go through all the strategic priorities, all four of them, but I think it's important to note that there's a lot of green on this page, which of course is leading towards a good story. <clears throat> but there's a few areas that I'd like to call out. Uh, the first is that of growing faster than the market. And we know that, that the market that they're currently operating is projected to grow you know, exponential amounts over the next few years, so there's lots of organic opportunities there. But there's this sort of like over, there's this issue of, of a competitor that's sort of fledgling or having some problems. And, and we see some interesting outcomes just at a very summary level. And that's Alcatel Lucent. Um, you know, a few things to identify. Somehow they've been able to, you know, get some pretty significant top line growth, 23% compared to, compared to Ericsson's eight. I know there's some very different business operating models and all that type of thing, but still an interesting insight. And secondly is that of R&D. Again, I mean, you know, you, you see 16.6% being spent uh, as a percentage of net sales by Alcatel-Lucent compared to 147 If you take that sort of difference and apply it to Ericsson's top line, that's actually $36 million in the difference. And so, you know, again, it just brings up some, some topics of innovation and like where some of the investments are being made, at least at Alcatel. And the second point, really, that I'd like to call out, and it's been mentioned before, is that of all the cash sitting on the books. And, you know, there are some finance implications when we talk about, you know, return on invested capital and weighted average cost of capital, all that kind of thing. But from a strategic perspective, it means that there is a, there is a capacity, an opportunity to deploy some capital and get into some new markets. And to speak about some more of the finance stuff, I'm going to actually pass it over to Hussein. So the two initiatives we've so far outlined are just the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg for Ericsson. However, these two initiatives will create, by 2015, $900 million in revenue and $300 million in incremental EBITDA. By 2020, this increases to $4.5 billion in additional revenue and $1.5 billion in additional EBITDA. What's really incredible about this is the role of the Lumi Smart Service that Dan mentioned. This will play a significant role in revenue. The significance of this is that, as Dan mentioned, it works as an annuity, sustainable long-term revenue generation. That is significant. As was touched on earlier, these two initiatives will generate $1.6 billion in incremental EBITDA. And again, the LumiSmart service plays a significant role here with about $900 million of that. So how are we going to do this? The first step right out of the door is going to be due diligence and negotiating the partnership agreements and the acquisition of Loomis Smart, with a goal to have the first agreement in place in one year's time. But the emphasis on that must not end there. This is a continued ongoing investment in identifying new opportunities in health and energy and executing upon them for Ericsson. The second phase will involve re renewing our focus on our existing technologies and network infrastructure. And finally, the third phase will involve expanding that focus to the developing world. Ultimately, the strategy that we've outlined here for energy and healthcare will help Ericsson improve the quality of life both in the developed world and the developing world, will generate long-term sustainable revenue and earnings growth, and finally, will cement Ericsson's position as a leader in the network society. Thank you, and we look forward to answering your questions. Okay, thank you for a very good presentation. Um, I have a question on the um, healthcare part of the presentation. 
um, and specifically where you outline the American well um, aspect. So what is your view on Ericsson ending up competing with mobile operators in this space? Yeah, um, we, we probably should have in that in presentation. So really, we actually see this a, as a partnership because uh, I think it's very important not to compete with the operators. Um, uh, as, as you guys are aware, <laughs> um, it's, it's very important, I think, to develop that relationship and actually kind of pile them onto that, that value chain for that offering. So, so yeah, I, I think that, that's, that we should develop those relationships. Okay. Okay, question on this, um, on uh, Cavett Technologies, right? Um, can you go back to that slide for a second? Where you have the picture, Ericsson EMA? Okay. Yeah, so what is this EMA again? So uh, it's basically your uh, application that allows for energy management. So any device that is connected to it, uh, it'll collect and pool the information on energy consumption and usage. Uh, it, it'll, you know, compile that information in a database, allow for analysis, so that you can really work as a consumer or a business owner to reduce your energy footprint through the information you're provided. You really understand what your energy consumption levels are, and you do that through the application that's developed. So who's providing this device inside the house? So for uh, the caveat technologies, uh, we recommend right now that it's uh, industrial and commercial focused uh, currently. Um, the technology is developed for fluorescent lights. However, uh, it can be adapted to, uh, to any other appliance. Uh, the company is actually working with Tesla Motors to try to incorporate intellectual vehicles, but that is not yet, uh, that is not yet have been developed, right? But what we're suggesting is, I mean, you have GE developing uh, you know, fridges with chips, dishwashers, et cetera. We'd have an open source platform with Ericsson EMA where information from all other appliances could be shared as well. Okay, but that's good. Yeah. My question was, who is taking the cost of providing this box inside the house? So we would see that uh, Ericsson, so currently Cavett has their own uh, sales force that, that does this and does the installation. So through the acquisition, you would acquire those capabilities. So does the user have to pay for the box? Yeah, so it's currently uh, in the industrial and commercial uh, area, it's $2,200 per box. Uh, the cost of goods sold, I believe, on that box is $600, so there, there's quite a lot of margin in that area. The break-even is 12 months, so within one year, you've recouped all your costs on the installation of that box. So um, it, it, it's something that, that's been proven at the CFO level that is sort of a... Uh, a no-brainer from their perspective in terms of the, the instant return they get on uh, energy savings. So I've got kind of like an add-on question to what Arun was asking. Um, given the fact that you said the market that Cabot operates in is fragmented, at least with the six others that you identified, can you just elaborate on your thought process on what uh, led you to the recommendation to acquire Cabot as opposed to partner with them? and uh, allow you to then partner with other vendors in the space or other people so you're not competing with vendors that provide such a specific technology? So f from our standpoint, um, it's, a, it's a new startup that has uh, immense potential. And there's no other technology like it in the market. And we feel that Ericsson's ability to develop applications and have the network infrastructure to take it to the next step, uh, they'd be able to do that. Uh, we feel that Ericsson does have the capabilities, but but what they don't have is the intellectual property, and that and the sales force, and that's the key in the acquisition, and that's why we recommended an acquisition versus the partnership. So, from a cost-benefit perspective, buying Cabot would allow Ericsson much more of an entry point than just partnering with them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, it's also at this point a relatively small organization. Um, you know, I don't think it would be classified as maybe a startup, but I mean, they're very much in their early phases. And, you know, to partner with them would, would essentially just be an ability to sort of, you know, somehow integrate your technology or, or combine technologies. And I think that probably from an Ericsson's managerial standpoint or strategy standpoint, it'd probably be much more efficient just to have them operating under the, you know, within the, within the, uh, the book of business. Yep. Thank you. 
your healthcare example for a second. Uh, go, to the, go to the slide number. Where we have the understanding the dynamics here. Yeah. Where are the insurance companies in this slide? Absolutely. So um, basically, the insurance companies. <laughs> Sounds odd, but they sort of circle this entire system, okay? They would be the primary client uh, who's really paying the bill, so to speak, in the U.S. market for, for this product, okay? This product would operate for uh, insured and uninsured uh, patients, but from an insurer standpoint, the way it typically works is the patient has a choice to actually go to a physical doctor or sign in to visit their doctor at an American well. They decide to go to American Well, and it takes them 15 minutes, let's say, to you know, get a diagnosis, get a prescription, and you know, get signed off kind of thing. So that same sort of um, service, actually going to, an in, in, going to physically see the doctor, let's say would have, cost, or would have taken 30 minutes. And so the doctor bills the insurer for the insured patient's time, for 15 minutes versus 30 minutes. And that's really the sort of like value driver. You talk about, you know, value proposition. The value proposition for this product, you know, it sort of swirls all around here, but it's really big for the insurance company. I mean, it's a cost-saving opportunity for them. So, you know, one of the things that the insurance companies are working with, and I'm sure you know this, is really paying for performance. Yes. So how does this guarantee provide a performance? Uh, you know, great question. And I think... The way that they've set this up, which is very interesting, is when a patient signs in and he fills out or she fills out sort of a, a survey as to what their ailments are, and they, they get a doctor who's essentially waiting in the queue to take their service, that patient has an opportunity to look at this, let's say, let's be honest, complete stranger of a doctor and essentially read a number of the reviews that other patients have given this doctor. And the patient can therefore reject this doctor if he does not like or if she does not like the reviews given to that doctor. And so eventually, you know, like you would see in an eBay model where, you know, poor buyers, poor sellers get a bunch of, you know, bad marks, they're almost eliminated out of the system. And so, you know, you might, the follow-up question might be, well, how do doctors get involved? What's their opportunity? Well, you know, they don't have to buy into a practice. They can operate from home for the most part. They don't have to operate the bricks and mortar of a clinic and all of the administrative staff. So, you know. Assuming all the care can be delivered through a mobile phone. Okay, and, and so, you know, and a lot of the care is done largely through a laptop system, right? So it's, I mean, we're, we're thinking that there's very much an opportunity to expand this to a mobile platform, but, you know, a lot of this right now is done through, through laptops. And you're right, um, you know, th there's, a cer there's certain limitations to how this model can work. And that's actually what we're kind of thinking about American Well 2.0. You start having integration into more devices so that, you know, it used to be that I would have to physically tell the doctor who I'm looking at on the laptop screen what my ailments are, but now I may be able to have certain devices. Maybe it's even my handheld mobile phone where I'm able to have them listen to my chest, take my heartbeat, you know, take my temperature, you know, the list goes on, but that, you know, you sort of start thinking down the line about some of the other opportunities. Can you go to your financial slide, the last one that you have? Why should I bother with them help? <laughs> it, it's something that's, you know. Change into, for, for people to kind of change into this new platform, you know, whether it's a technology issue or whether it's a trust issue, it takes a little bit of time. However, we think that, you know, over the long run, this is where um, the money is going to be made. This is where... I, I think, you know, it's, it's going to be a technology issue for one. Once, for example, what Paul said, when, you know, that your phone can take the temperature off, off your wrist, you know, and once the data management capabilities, the security is all factored in, and, you know, there's an adoption level that comes with it too, right? And we've kind of factored that in as well. But we do think, you know, maybe 2020 and beyond, maybe 2020 to 2030, that e-health, the m-health, sorry, will eclipse pretty much everything. As Paul mentioned, health is a 2.3 trillion dollar industry in the states and you know there's only one way for this to go and that is you know a democratization of healthcare where patients have charge so it's a trend that's going there yeah it'll take a little bit of time but if Ericsson gets in there right now gets in early it will be the leader in this area 
And I think that's important. So that's why that investment right now makes sense. It's to build that long-term growth. Thank you very much. Thank you.